Hi, and welcome back. This is Scott Pekarik with Verde Property Management here today with Matt Engel with the Engel Law Firm here to talk about the eviction process. How are you doing, Matt? Very good. Well, we are on the much anticipated part three of three, and today's topic will be post eviction, the post eviction process. We've made it through the pre eviction, we've served the summons, we've gone to court. Now what happens? Now what happens? Um, so we talked in our in our last segment kind of about uh, finding solutions to uh, the issue. You know, did a tenant do a payment plan? Are they making their payments on time? Did they not make their payments on time? Um, or is there some other part of the agreement that we came up with? Example, if they agreed to vacate in 10 days, did they leave when they say they were going to leave? Uh, so uh, post eviction is, is kind of like that's where you're looking at do we need to get the sheriff involved and when is if the tenant doesn't do what they said they're going to do so again we, we talked about um, a default right a default is if you went to court hearing went to the court hearing and the tenant didn't show up you get a court order that says you can order what's called a writ of recovery for the sheriff so that's the only way you can regain possession of property right is by getting what's called a writ of recovery a writ of recovery is a piece of paper that the sheriff brings to the apartment or to the house and knocks on the door and either hands it to the person and says you got 24 hours to get out and if you don't i'm coming back to physically remove you that's what a writ does a writ is a writ is a piece of paper it's an order from the judge to the sheriff remove all occupants from this address that's what a writ is and that's our ultimate goal when you do an eviction right you do right. an eviction because you want possession of the property and the writ is the ultimate goal to get that i mean obviously you do the eviction you either want to get paid or you want to get the property back right and the writ is the tool that allows that to happen. Yeah, because sometimes you get people who just won't leave. Well, right. They won't yeah. pay, they won't leave. They, they hold over, they don't pay, and they're just like, I'm going to dig in until you force me out. Right, right. right. And, and we do see that, right? Um, I think we had a, the record number of evictions on one person was like 11 over four years. She always got caught up until that last time. Right. Um, a, anyway, so how, like, what does that cost? Like, to, and, and how long does it take? Yeah, so the writ process... Um, it can take anywhere from three to 10 days. I mean, it depends on the county. It depends on the sheriff. It depends if there's any court holidays. It depends on the weekends. Because when you're dealing with a sheriff in this, you know, either service or process or writ service, every sheriff's department has a, a civil process division or a civil division. And it's in the civil division where they deal with like mortgage foreclosure sales and serving mm -hmm. papers and serving writs and they don't work after 4.30 p.m. and they don't work on the weekends. So if you're not in there getting your business done during, during, during normal business hours, you're waiting till the next day. And they're in no hurry. It's just like any other uh, government position is that right. you just first come, first serve and you get taken care of when you get taken care of. So again, our, our ultimate goal is, is to get that, uh, not our goal, um, our last tool to finalize the process is getting the writ of recovery for the sheriff. So uh, the cost to the court. So uh, how do you get a writ? Well, uh, when we were at, the, at the, the, the hearing process, if the tenant signed a payment plan or a settlement agreement to make certain payments to get caught up yep. and they missed a payment, you would call me or email me and say, Matt, Scott missed his second payment of $1,000 that was due on January 8th. I could go into the court on the 9th or e-file what's called an affidavit of violation of settlement agreement. It's basically me saying that tenant missed a $1,000 payment. The court order from the hearing says that if tenant violates the agreement, I can file an affidavit as such, and they'll give me the writ right off, right over the counter. There's no further hearing. There's no notice. I can get the writ immediately for the sheriff if there's a violation of the agreement. Similar if someone defaults. If they default, that default order says you could go, you could walk into, or I could go out to the counter in Hennepin County and buy the writ of recovery 30 seconds after the judge signed the order, and I would grab the writ and I would walk it over to the sheriff, and the sheriff would have it within 30 minutes of the hearing. So that's how quick it can go to get that writ. And again, a kind of the, uh, the writ cost uh, itself is I think the, uh, uh, the court charges us $60 to get the writ, um, and then the sheriff's fee uh, to post or serve the writ is $125. Um, 
And then I, th I think I have a, a half hour of billing time that goes into preparing and filing the affidavit or filing the letter or correspondence to get the writ and then bringing it over to the sheriff. So not inexpensive, but I mean, at this point, you want the property back. So right. you know, and, and, and every day you have that property occupied, vacant, whatever, that it's not producing rent is money you're losing. Yeah, if it's investor. offline, you're, you're not making money on it. And, 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 and at this point, it's highly unlikely anyone's paying you anything. Right, when point. we're to the writ process. Right. Yeah, so at that, you, you get the writ over to the sheriff, uh, and then the process from there is they go serve or post it at night. I know in Hennepin County, they serve most of their writs in the evening or into the night, um, and then their civil uh, deputies work in the office during the day. Uh, the rule with the writ, uh, or, or the writ says it's time to go. Uh, you've got 24 hours to leave. Um, if they still don't leave after that, you have to call the sheriff's uh, department and get what a schedule what's called a lockout, or what we would call the physical eviction. So you would say, what's your next available time and date? And this is where it could be two days later, it could be 10 days later, it depends on how busy their, how full their calendar is. Right. So they might say, you know what, we got an opening on January 14th at 9 a.m. And I'd say, I t I'll take it. So they write down that we'll have a deputy at this property at this point in time, and they'll say, who's gonna meet, who's gonna meet the sheriff there? And I'll say, well, Scott Picaric, and I'll give his phone number. And then as the property manager, you would meet the sheriff at the property to do the lockout. Um, part of that process is you have to, under the statute, you need to send a letter to the tenant, a statutory notice letter that says, Dear Tenant, a lockout has been scheduled for such and such a date with the Hennepin County Sheriff. You need to have all your belongings removed and that sort of thing. And you need to mail it and you need a copy of it, or keep a copy of it. In addition, the statute says that the property manager or the owner needs to make a good faith effort to notify the tenant of the date and time of the lockout. Could that be via email? So I tell people do an email because it creates a trail, especially yep. if you've emailed with the tenant in the past, you could say, listen, this is a good email address. Here's a sample or an email chain. And I emailed it to them. In the statute, they say a telephone call, but that's before they started. They still haven't implemented, you know, text communicating or emails in the statutory process, although it's allowable for the most part when it comes to giving notices. So I tell my landlord clients, I say, hey, uh, not only do you drop the letter in the mail and keep a copy for yourself, Text it to them and email it to them because it takes very little time or effort to do it, and now you've right. covered all your bases. Right, right. Yeah. There's no doubt Correct. at that point. Well, it, kind of a sidebar, but like say someone, you know they're gone. Say they, they got the, uh, the, the writ of recovery and they vacated. Do you still need to get the sheriff to lock them out? Or how do you, how do you determine, or even before you get the writ? Like say you, you went to the hearing, they didn't show up. And it's winter. I know it's you know today's January of 2020. What would I have to do to to recover the premises if I you know they didn't show up for court? I mean, this this gets in some gray area, right? Because it, it does. So you're looking at the situation, and you could go as far back as you want in our eviction process. I mean, you could do that analysis at pre-eviction. Yeah. Uh, meaning. Uh, there, there's a kind of an exception or a theory at law called abandonment, yep. meaning if you go to the unit and it's completely empty and they've left the doors open and there's no one there and there's no evidence of anyone being there, as a landlord, you could deem it abandoned and retake possession. But you'd have to know that the downside for you is if you don't legally terminate possession through an eviction action, the tenant could show up two weeks later and say, what the heck, you took over my unit and you didn't legally terminate my right to possess it. I, I don't was care. living, I was visiting friends I was Bali. visiting friends or yeah. whatever. Or you might walk in and there might be a sofa and some garbage in the fridge and you might say, ah, they've, they've abandoned it. But you don't know that for sure. So what I tell my, my clients is you need to decide and you need to document with photographs or, you know, if, if the tenant sent you an email saying, I'm moving out and they dropped the key off at the office, but they left some crap in the unit, you probably have pretty good evidence of an abandonment and you don't have to spend the time and money and effort on doing the eviction. Right. However, if you haven't heard from them and you're not sure if it's abandoned and there's still some stuff left in a unit, still some, still some things in the garage, you probably want to go through with the full process, do the eviction. If they don't show up, now you've got a default. Now you can call the sheriff and, and do the lockout thing. Okay. Um, it's, it's when the sheriff does the lockout um, where the sheriff brings what's called an inventory form. 
So anytime a sheriff does a lockout, he's got an inventory. Now, a lot of sheriffs just put C photo inventory because every landlord right. is there taking pictures. Some of them are more strict, and they say, Scott, you got to go through every room and list everything and that's in there, and then the sh it's the sheriff's job to, to send that out and say this is the inventory of what's left behind. You know, and then we can talk about, you know, the 28 day hold on to it rule and those sorts of things. Yeah. Well. So like the 28 days after the lockout, um, is it different in, in the case of abandonment? Is that a, does that a, so a aband lock? abandonment would be the same, same thing. Okay. right? So that the 28 day rule is if the tenant leaves personal property behind, presumably something of value, like you don't have to store bags of garbage, right? right? If it's rubbish and trash, you document it with photos and you clean it out. But if there's some furniture, some desks, some big screen TVs, which, you know, those don't get left behind. But you know what I'm saying? Right. If there's something you deem that might have value, um, whether it's abandonment or whether it's 28 days from the date of the lockout, that's, that's the rule is you need to hold it, store it on site for 28 days. Uh, and there's a difference there, meaning... Um, if you store on site, you can use the shorter 28 days period. If you store it off site, to say you decide to get a pod or something and you, or store it in a, a storage unit somewhere, yep. it's a whole different statutory process which requires 60 days right. and, and certified notice and publicate, and then there's just all kinds of things. So I tell people, the easiest way to do it is to store it if you have to store it. Find stuff. a room, put it in the basement, in the basement, garage. Basement, garage, yeah, yeah and, and to store Unless it you want to get on too. storage wars. There's well, no yeah. reason to, like, you know, to, to, yeah. to make things more complicated. For and, and part of that, too, the statute says is if the tenant makes a written request um, to pick up their stuff, you've got to accommodate. You've got to say, okay, I'll meet you there tomorrow or whatever and give them the opportunity to get their stuff back. And you can't sit there and say, pay me all my back rent to get your stuff. It doesn't work that way. If you're storing their stuff and they make a request to come get it, you got to, you got to let them come get it. Okay. What about, uh, you know, unlikely there's going to be any security deposit left over, but say there is like, say they had a, you got $5,000 because you knew they were, you were going to evict them or something, right? That horrible credit poor tenant history. You're like, I'm going to rent to these people. I'm going to get $5,000. And miraculously, there's $800 left after all of this. What, and, and that's doubtful, but I'm saying hypothetically, what is the date you use for, if no, even if there's no deposit left, for sending out the disposition, right? Because normally right. it's a 21-day at, what, end of tenancy, which is the move-out date, correct? Right. So I would say it's 21 days from when you've, you know, taken possession of the property. Okay. So if you deem it abandoned and you have changed the locks and taken your photographs and you took possession, that's when you would start your 21 day window. Or let's just say they sent you an email and said, I moved out on this day and they dropped off the key. You're probably going to want to use that day as your 21 day start date, as opposed to whatever day you, you deem it to be um, in your possession. Same thing with the sheriff. The 21 days would start the day after you have the sheriff's lockout. So okay. that's, that would be day one, and you would count 21 days. There's some language in the statute that says the 21 days starts from when um, there's some language about getting a forwarding address. I have found that some of my clients won't send the letter because they didn't get a forwarding address, and they end up getting into some trouble later. Send a like, last known address, right? Yeah, and I'm just like, don't. Don't rely on using that language. Just send it to the last known address. If they right. didn't give you a forwarding address, send it to the last address because they probably have mail forwarding. Or if they don't, it's going to come back to right. you. And then you have an envelope for the judge. And the, email it, right? Like just or, cover and your or bases. Or email it, yeah. Um, so, again, the statute requires that you mail it. But, again, yeah, right, right. If, if they sue you because what tenants love to do is they'll go to uh, uh, conciliation or small claims court. And they'll see you under 504B.178, which I believe is the security deposit disposition statute. And they'll say, well, you deducted $500 for the carpets, and it's my claim that the carpets were crappy when I moved in. Or you didn't need to paint the whole house. You only needed to paint the inside of the house. You only need to paint one bedroom. So they're going to complain about how much money you took. And then they're going to complain, you know, to some extent that you didn't send me the letter on time. Right. You didn't send it here. So again, if you have, listen, I didn't get a forwarding address. I sent it to the last known address, which was the property address. It either went to them or it got returned to you. And either way, you're going to have some evidence or proof that no, I did send it out. And so then that's where you would cover yourself. Because that statute has uh 
uh, penalty clauses in it. Oh, right, yeah. right. It says if uh, if a landlord doesn't send the letter, you're presumed that you, you kept the security deposit in bad faith. Right. And they can double it, right? Uh, and, and, and nail you with the double the amount. Right, right. And I always advise people, look, even the, the key is to hit the date. You know, do it, do it in advance of the 21 days. Even if there's a dispute on the amount, the key is to make sure you get it out before the, the 21 days expires. Correct. Because a dispute is simply a dispute. Like you're getting, but there, you don't have the penalties that go in auto, like by, by default, right? Right, because of right. The, if the you statute. don't send it. Yeah, well, and, you, and you can argue, you know, did this $100 you know, should have been charged or not. Look, you have plenty of time to, to make those, those, those have those debates. But right. but by missing the the twenty one day window, you've really put yourself in an undesirable position. Correct. You you don't want to blow that because it's the easiest way for them to make a claim uh, against you and to get it doubled, which which isn't isn't awesome. Either. And those of you out there that are saying, oh, you know, it's, it's nobody reminded me till the seventeenth of the month or the seventeenth day. That's fine. Get it out on the seventeenth mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Or the 18th day or the 19th day, but don't wait till the 22nd day. Right. Please. I, I've had other clients try to say, well, I don't know how much the damages are yet because I have all my contractors are busy Estimate. and they haven't come in and they haven't told me if it's going to be three or five thousand dollars. And I'm like, look, it doesn't matter. You got 21 days to figure it out. You don't need a twelve thousand dollar estimate because. A lot of landlords think that I'm going to send a disposition letter that says I kept all your security deposit and you owe me $4,000. A disposition letter isn't a collection action, right. so you don't have to have the final number because you're going to have to do that in small claims court anyway. Well, let's talk about that. It's a great segue to conciliation court, right? I mean, I believe, and this is my, my opinion, that it is a waste of time to try to collect this money. I believe that you it's one thing to win a, a judgment. It's a completely other thing to actually collect any of this money. And I think that for most people in most situations, you're wasting a lot of time uh, and a lot of energy on something you're never going to see. Right. It, and, and I get the question all the time, Matt, do you do collections? This tenant owes me a couple grand. Can I pay you to go to small claims court? How much is the filing fee? I'm like, you know what? For the most part, um, there's a reason tenants are tenants and that they can't, aren't buying a house is because they typically either can't afford it or they don't have credit or they don't have assets, right? So, and then second of all, the reason they didn't pay you the rent is because they didn't have any money. So to your point, the return on investment when it comes to spending your time and money going after tenants who didn't pay their rent is very low. So when people come and ask me and they say, listen, I could tell five people a month that I would take their money to go sue someone in small claims court. But eventually you're going to get pissed at me because I'm not, you're not getting any money back because it's rare that I would ever find any money available from this tenant that would pay you up, that would be able to pay you. Right. Um, and look at it this way too. A, a judgment from small claims court is, is in essence a piece of paper, right? If you want to pursue that judgment, you've got to do what's transcribe it to district court, and you've got to pay another $100 fee to open a district court file number because it's only in district court that you can use collection methods like uh, bank levy, wage garnishment, those sorts of things have to be done through district court. So you've got to get your conciliation court judgment over to district court, and then from there you can implement those other things, which cost more money. And so then, you know, at that point I say, okay, well, Let's assume you have a tenant who didn't pay, and you know they have a good job, and you know where they work, and you have copies of checks, so you know where they bank. That's probably a better start than if you if you have um, other types of low-income tenant properties where there isn't a lot of assets or if they're getting rental assistance. I mean, anyone who's getting any sort of assistance is, in essence, exempt from a judgment anyway. So now you spend all this time and money and effort going after a tenant when your likelihood of collecting are, is really low. Yeah, and I know there's some people out there, well, I'm going to do it for the principle of it. Well, okay, fine. But, um, you know, I, I don't advise people nailing themselves to a cross to try to, you know, make an example out of somebody that it really isn't going to have any impact on their life. You really, uh, again, if it, we want to do our best we, job we can pre-screening people up front and making sure that, you know, people who, you know, have poor credit and poor rental history you know, may not be good fits for our property, right? So that's where you right. do your, that's where you do your legwork. And after the fact, you know, it's it is pretty rare that that people get through our screening process. It happens, but you know that's where I say put you know put our energy into that process 
and we hope to avoid you know things on the other end. And you know the the thing is like through this eviction process, again, it's not like our goal is to get you paid. Like, right. I mean, that, again, right, that, that's right what up, I, I right said at the, the beginning end. is is that when you send me a file and I review the lease, the ledger, the rental license, all those sorts of things, and when I go to he, to the hearing and I have my discussion with the tenant, my goal is to find a solution. My goal is to put money into your pocket um, so so that you can recover on that. And, and again, if if it's a problem tenant, if you if you're tired of someone anyway, but you don't have a strong enough case for a breach of lease or something like a tenant could be late on the rent 10 times in a row. There's no judge that's going to look at that as a material breach that renders them to sign an order saying you've got to get out of this property. Right. So you got to think about a breach to a judge has got to be a material breach, which is something significant. Right. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, yeah, let's find a solution. And if they want to do a payment plan, great. You can put money in your pocket, but guess what? We've got some teeth now. If they miss one of those payments, that right. you can get your property back. Well, I would say on on you know, anecdotally, over half of the people that end up like uh, from our office into your hands, over half end up paying and staying at the property. And I, and I, I could get the exact numbers, but it's it's really it's our method of last resort to try to get them to pay. And our goal still, even through the eviction hearing, is to hopefully they honor the payment plan right. and stand the property no, absolutely we want them to honor the payment plan because yeah. it, it 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 reduced costs for the owner and it puts more money in their pocket as opposed to having to turn the unit over find a new tenant go through the screening process uh and that sort of thing in in the and again the judges they they want that and so at the end of the day every county is pushing the ability to at least have a discussion over is there a way we can solve this problem uh, b before you know they sign an order for a writ. Awesome, awesome. Well, that uh, uh, good stuff, all of it. Um, yeah, and on the collections too, uh, we talked about return on investments and small claims court and that sort of thing. The key factor there to, to understand is that an eviction is for possession of property only. So even though I might list three months of unpaid rent on the complaint, I don't get a money judgment in, cons in in housing court through an eviction action to say tenant owes landlord X amount of dollars. You'll never get that out of an eviction action. The only judgment we can get in an eviction is for possession. So a lot of people, when, when I go to court for them um, and the tenant says, you know what, Matt, I don't have the money, I'll be out in six days. I in every case, um, the judge has, there, there's called a hardship uh, provision in the landlord tenant statute where the judge can what's called stay or delay the issuance of the writ of recovery. And so if a tenant says, I've got kids, I've got a disability, I'm going to, through a divorce, whatever they say, the judges always give them this extra seven days. So even if I showed up at court and said, you know what, I don't have a payment plan to offer you, you need to pay it all today, the judge is going to give them either seven days to either vacate or pay in full, which allows them to redeem within that time period. So my point was, okay, if I know they're already gonna get seven days and I can say, listen, I'll give you nine days or 10 days, or if, if the seventh day falls on a Friday, I'll say, listen, I'll give you till Sunday night to get all your stuff out. That's part of the idea of, I can give them a little more leeway to, you know, even the, it makes them feel good to treat your property better. They right. might, be, might be kicking holes in sheetrock and banging the doors if they feel like we've given them some extra time to vacate and, and to move their stuff out. Be a little less draconian and, in your approach. Right. And hopefully and, you'll get some reciprocity in that process. And, and you, you see that a lot. And there's no guarantee that they won't do things like that. But, the, but what I, where I was going with that as well is some owners or landlords would say, well, so you just agreed that they would leave, and I'm not. And you're not collecting my money, and that's where it comes back. Heck, to, I probably said that to Matt. In well, the past. Right, you know, everyone does. <laughs> you know, and so that's where I come back to: is the eviction is for possession of the property only. The only way it would be me getting you money is if I'm doing that payment plan, which is allows them to redeem, right, right to, to right. pay what's due and owing, because that's what the judges really want us to do. So again, just because someone agrees to vacate um, doesn't mean we're letting them off. They still owe you the money. You can still go to collections. You can still do your return on investment analysis of should I go to court against this tenant? Yeah, and I know and, some people are, they're, they're, they're militant, adamant about doing that you know, following up and, and trying to collect. And I know there's collection agencies that are out there that'll take anywhere from 30 to 70% of right. what they collect. And you know what? That's uh, that's great. If someone wants to, to do that, fantastic. But I have not had 
any real success. Even people who started paying, they stopped within a month or two. Right. And it, it's just, it's not, it's not a good use of my energy. I would rather spend the energy screening better and focusing on, you know, maintaining the properties we do have and, and building out the portfolios for people. And my, my opinion or my, my advice to my clients is that you can do it if you want. Um, I can do it, but I choose not to because I know that eventually you're not going to be happy right. when you write me X number of checks going after these people if I don't get anything from you. Right. And I know that the likelihood of me collecting is going to be very low. So I would rather just give you the truth up front and say, you know, I'm happy to make $250 an hour doing litigation, but at the end of the day, you know, you're throwing good money after bad 90% of the time. Right. So unless you unless you have some really um, specific circumstances of someone with a high paying job, you know where they work, you know where they bank, you know they have assets, you know they own real estate somewhere else, you probably will just want to, those those are the ones you want to consider. Right, and, and, and I agree, there's exceptions to the rule always, right? right? right. But it, it really... I would say in general, you know, broad generalization, it's going to be a waste of time and energy, but there are exceptions. So mm. cross those, uh, those bridges when you come to them uh, individually. So uh, anything else you can think of, Matt? Uh, this has been, this has been awesome. Like, yeah, I think we've, uh, I mean, we've covered as many topics as we can over these three segments. Again, we had uh, pre-eviction considerations. We talked about the lease, the ledger, rental license, uh, uh, important things for your lease before we can even bring the eviction. And we talked about the eviction hearing, what happens, that it's kind of like an arraignment, an initial appearance. Uh, the judges like to have uh, payment plans and settlement agreements or vacate dates and what happens that at the eviction hearing itself. And then we talked about post eviction. What is a writ of recovery? Having to get the sheriff involved, storing property for 28 days. And then after that, it's like, you, you know, uh, someone owes you some money. Now you got to make the business decision. Is it worth your time and effort to go after that? Again, I don't do it, but if people want to send it to collection agencies or do it on their own, you know, that's their own decision. Right. And I think you take those case by case. And yeah. as we talked about, some, some might pay off. Um, I'm of the mindset many will not. And you just have to take it case by case and do the ROI on it. Right. So, Matt, if someone wants to get a hold of you, what is the best way to contact you? So right now, I think uh, just going to the website and getting my email address. Uh, my website is theenglefirm.com. That's T-H-E, the word the, Engel, E-N-G-E-L. F-I-R-M.com. I've got a new website coming out in a couple weeks, evictionminnesota.com, uh, so be looking for that. Uh, or our phone number, our office number is 612-373-7060. Uh, awesome. Thank right. you so much, Matt. This was like this was great. I learned something, believe it or not, folks. And Okay, so uh, I'm Scott Bakarik with Verde Property Management. Uh, if you want to reach us, you can contact us via text or phone at 612-600-8888. That's my direct line, 612-600-8888. Or you can go to our website, verde-realestate.com, and go to the property management tab, and that'll also get you in contact with us. So uh, we hope this was valuable to you. And it, like always, if we can be of future service, please let us know. I'm Scott Pekarek with Verde Real Estate Group, Verde Property Management, along with Matt Engel with The Engel Law Firm. Correct. Got it right this time. And uh, we uh, wish you guys uh, much success in 2020. Thank you.